Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Bo Lanyon. I'm an events producer for the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. Uh, the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D is a first of a kind collaboration between the region's four universities. That's UWE Bristol, Bath Spa, University of Bath and the University of Bristol. And of course, Digital Creativity Centre Watershed. The programme connects the world to university research and creative business to develop a shared vision for tomorrow's creative industries. And a core part of that programme are Pathfinders. So these are themed creative R&D projects that are designed to lead the Bristol and Bath cluster into the future and to engage with emergent technologies and to develop a diverse new talent base. There are five Pathfinders running from 2019 through until 2023 with digital placemaking, expanded performance, and amplified publishing to date and the forthcoming creative ecologies. So do visit us at bristolbathcreative.org for more. Do sign up to our newsletter and follow us at bristol underscore bath rd. Uh, just to flag up that today's talk is also being recorded and will be available on the Watershed's YouTube channel. So our events program allows us to share the thoughts, the conversations and the work that's being done across the cluster and we'll be sharing the details of more events in the new year. Now today we are delving into the notion of physical and event hybridity and we'll be hearing about how the Bristol Arts Channel brought a diverse programme of in-person cultural content online in record time. So today's panel is chaired by Claire Reddington. Claire is the CEO of The Watershed and the industry co-director of the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. Claire joined the Watershed in 2004, establishing its creative technology programmes, including Pervasive Media Studio and Playable City. Catherine Jukes is the curator of the Bristol Arts Channel, which is an award-winning uh, creative consultant and digital producer. And as a creative lead, she's designed experiences for clients, including Twitter, the Royal Shakespeare Company and the BBC. Latoya McAllister-Jones is the executive director of St Paul's Carnival and was previously head of operations at Ujima Radio and has significant experience working across a range of communities and cultural institutions in Bristol, and particularly with African Caribbean led community organizations. Now we're also pleased to have an additional guest join us today. This is Jack Fater, who is a campaigns manager at Bristol Old Vic. And over lockdown, he helped build Bristol Old Vic at Home, which is the theater's first experiment in bringing theater arts directly to people where they were. Also, welcome to our BSL interpreters, Catherine Moxon and David Wolferden. Now, after our panel's presentations, there will be a discussion which will include questions from you, the audience. So please send your questions through to us using the Q&A function, not the chat. That's really important and helpful. So send your questions through as you have them to help avoid a rush at the end. And that's using the Q&A panel, not the chat. Thanks. So now, over to Claire and the panel. Hello everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to come together today to, uh, to kind of remember and think through and start to try and codify some of the learning from Bristol Arts Channel. Um, before you all joined us, we're having a bit of a chat about how sort of end of the year feeling um, we are. We're sort of all hanging on for Christmas. Um, and so that, that time to kind of look back um, and then perhaps to look a bit into the future and to project ourselves into what we might do with some of the learnings and some of the ways of working that we that we first tried out in Bristol Arts Channel um, is really welcome for me today. So we're going to hear first um, from Catherine Jukes, who's going to give us a real kind of deep dive into the channel, what it was, how it worked, but also the wider context of how the world went digital um, during the first lockdown. And then we'll hear from Latoya and Jack about how St Paul's Carnival and Bristol World Vic um, engage with Bristol Arts Channel, what they've been doing, and we'll have a chat about the future. I guess I should start by, um, I should start the story so um, Bristol Arts Channel was Tom Morris's fault, um, as loads of things, I think, in the world. He can be blamed for anything. He's not here. Um, and he came to me and, and, and perhaps both of us were having an existential crisis because it was March and our venues had just been closed um, and we didn't really know what to do with ourselves. And he asked the question, how can we keep our audiences together during this time? How can we create a culture offer 
um, that exists online and that cross promotes and co cross pollinates our audiences in the same way that they do in real life. So we were sort of experimenting with keeping the internet local. Um, for anyone who's an avid um, member of the Bristol culture scene, it's not unusual to come into Watershed for a drink at lunchtime, go and see something at Bristol World Vic and end in Trinity. Um, there's a real sense of a kind of ecology of offer and we wanted to see what we could do, how we could um, take collective risks um, think about partnership and share a commitment to doing something differently. Um, and as Bo said, we did it really spectacularly quickly. Um, and that was one of the points of Bristol Wilds Channel is the speed in which we moved enabled none of us to think better of it. Um, so we pulled together a, a partners. So Colston Hall, St Paul's Carnival, Trinity, Spike Island, St George's, Make, Arnafini, Para Orchestra, Bristol Museums, and of course, um, Watershed and Bristol World Vic were, um, were the founding partners. And we sort of ran it as a common. So everything was um, agreed and thought about together. Um, and we got 15 grand of funding from Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. And that was the most joyful and useful 15 grand I think I've ever received in my life because it really just gave us the confidence to go. So we're going to start off um, from Catherine, as I said, who we really quickly got in to help us first um, through Catherine's association with the space, who came in with some sponsorship as well to help us think through what might a channel be and how might it work. Um, and then actually delivering the channel on curating and supporting and working goodness knows how many hours to ensure that the kind of brilliance of the offer was realized. So Catherine, over to you. Okay, great. I'm going to share my screen. Hello, everyone. You can tell that I wrote this last night. What just happened? I feel like we've blinked and the year has, has like gone, hasn't it? But it's also been very slow. I kind of wanted to start by thinking a little bit about the extraordinary journey we've been on as audience members, as people trying to navigate the last few months to remain connected to each other to keep ourselves entertained um, and like Claire said give a bit of context to some of the things that were happening around the same time as we were putting um, Bristol Arts Channel together. So we kind of know this like who remembers you know Tiger King at the beginning of lockdown audience behavior is changing and adapting to this new reality um, and kind of as many people in the art sector scrambled to get their heads around content production around rights management for their own intellectual property amongst kind of the devastating blow that was happening to the sector with shutdowns and furlough schemes a couple of really interesting things were happening People for sure, audiences for sure, were consuming content like never before. And um, there was, and there's still a massive spike in things like Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney, which kind of led to audiences consuming culture often in isolation. You know, a familiar site is kind of sitting with your laptop and, and binge watching a Netflix documentary. Um, you could also really easily spot the organizations who'd spent the time and money in investing in technology as a creative medium for like engaging with their audiences and entertaining their audiences. So right off the bat, people like uh, MT Live were able to start offering streams of their cinema broadcasts on YouTube. But also, you know, there were people who were learning as they went. You know, one of my favorite things was watching all of the American late night TV hosts hosts adapting to working from home they were kind of self-shooting their shows this was a screenshot I took of Seth Meyers trying to adjust his camera um, it was completely fascinating a kind of around this sort of time this early pandemic we also had that explosion where famous pop stars were doing gigs from their living rooms and gardens I mean this happened <laughs> that was april that was april i'm still not over it i'm still with it 
There are also like lots of really beautiful artistic responses to the pandemic. There's like um, this piece by Matthew Bourne, The Red Shoes at Home, which was a completely gorgeous example of self-shooting. Um, Birmingham Royal Ballet's Celine Gittens did a dying swan in the living room. Corey Baker did the amazing swan lake in bathtubs. There was that early pandemic. Lots of people were making stuff really, really quickly. But audiences were still craving a kind of shared experiences, that sense of togetherness. We saw kind of pop up street cinemas around the globe, the kind of um, digitally and emotionally sophisticated responses, in my opinion, came from folk who were able to use technology to be there for one another, like the residents of the street in Paris, their audiences, their arts community. Um, people like Manchester International Festival did this really great Zoom lunchtime sessions where anyone could rock up and, and join in a lunchtime session. The Slung Low team, um, aside from the extraordinary work they've been doing with running an emergency food parcel service and deliveries and the myriad of other rich and beautiful ways they supported their local community, started doing these really fun game shows live from the Holbeck, their venue. Um, which I really enjoyed going to. And then in Bristol, we saw um, morning assemblies starting to happen. So a, a self-organizing group of um, community members every morning at 9 a.m. would join a Zoom session and, and everyone would take it in turns to host an assembly, a morning assembly. There's something like a thousand people on that Facebook group now, and it's a very lovely thing. Physical installations, uh, were still happening. I produced a couple of them. This happened at the start of lockdown in, at the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. It's a piece called Singing Trees that used environmental data. Um, so when the environmental data showed that the pollution levels were too high, the trees couldn't sing. Uh, and when the pollution levels dropped, they could sing, but it could be overridden with a hug. This kind of worked really well as, as, a, as a lockdown project because actually um, it's naturally socially distant. The trees are often planted two meters apart. That's the way that city planners and architects like them. But this kind of emergence of outdoor work, I thought a lot actually over the last couple of months about playable cities, which obviously Claire can talk about um, being a watershed project but thinking about how you can embed digital first cultural offerings into the fabric of a, of a city in a really playful way. Things like this I really loved. Um, this was a piece called Screen the House Down by Marcus Lyell, who's the video designer for Chemical Brothers. Um, this idea of sort of physical and digital work, this hybrid events. So this was a, a, a Zoom call that you could join. There was a physical installation of lights inside a building in London and you joined a Zoom call and you screamed and it would light up the building, which was really fun and really playful. I'm also kind of always fascinated in what's happening in kind of performing arts adjacent sectors. This is the pandemic image that haunts my dreams because it's both brilliant and also kind of really upsetting. Um, this is Balman who uh, partnered with LG for their Paris Fashion Week this year uh, with the front rows of celebrities all attending virtually on these screens. And it was kind of lots of uh, people did this, this virtual presence, but they did it in a very design forward way. And then um, actually Fashion Week was really fascinating this year. Burberry became the first uh, fashion brand to team up with Twitch, which was a live streaming gaming platform. And this collaboration I think was kind of genius. It allowed uh, guests to view multiple perspectives of the show and to communicate through Twitch's chat function. If anyone was on it, it was complete chaos. That just, you know, lots of kids going completely wild. Um, but I kind of think it was a genius branding move for Burberry and for Twitch. And then this happened a bit later than Bristol Arts Channel, but I think it's still worth mentioning. It kind of happened maybe a week or two after we uh, finished our pilot phase. But Lost Horizon was the brainchild of the Shangri-La area at Glastonbury, who teamed up with uh, VR Jam and Sensar to deliver Lost Horizons, which was this amazing world which you could wander through and dance in and you could listen to cool music and bump into people living their best lives. I've heard that there was a tiny drunk fat boy Slim who had uh, picked an avatar of Halle Berry's body and a big smiley head. And it was kind of as surreal and as trippy as a real light late night adventure in Shangri-La, but was accessible in VR, on Twitch, on YouTube, on Beatport, on Facebook. They had something like um, 4.3 million viewers over the weekend. 
So um, the next couple of slides are very wordy. This is a summary report from the pilot program, which we're going to be releasing after the session for people to re uh, read at their own pace. I'm going to be skipping through quite a lot of the slides, but just know that you can download and read the report as you wish at a later date. As Claire said, uh, the context for uh, for Bristol Arts Channel is that within the first few weeks of the coronavirus pandemic hitting the UK, which caused loads of organisations across the country to temporarily shut their doors, we, we decided to do a citywide collaboration between Bristol based arts organisations. This kind of collective came together as a rapid response to the crisis. Uh, we talked a lot about wanting to offer a lockdown lifeline for local audiences missing the buzz and community of Bristol's brilliant art scene. This was the core group of organisations. There were kind of three core aims that I saw. One was to, um, our aim was to strengthen the online audiences for the participating organisations. This is quite important. We didn't want to set up a YouTube channel and then force all of our arts organisations to give us content that we would put out on a new space. We wanted people to put content out on their own channels and through the network effect and through amplifying each other and supporting each other, we would help drive audiences. Um, we didn't want people to have to shut the doors of their physical organisations and also shut the doors of their online organisations at the same time. The second aim was to support cultural organisations to develop digital content during lockdown who haven't done so before. And the third was to be as accessible as possible. So we thought a lot about how we could support the network to do captioning and BSL interpretation. So this is what, how, what happened and this is what we learned. Um, sorry, I'm getting cool. So the timeline, I think Claire's talked through that a little bit, but um, just to recap, because it's kind of wild when you read it on paper, how, how quickly we moved. But, you know, on the 5th of March, there was a number of COVID cases in the UK, which reached 100. Um, on the 12th, the UK Chief Medical Officer raised the coronavirus risk from moderate to high. On the 17th, we all closed our doors temporarily. On the 25th, that's when Claire and Tom Morris hatched a plan and put it to the space. Um, in April, I, myself and a, um, a colleague called Joe Bell from the space, who's another digital associate, were kind of began a scoping um, process, which felt a lot like just just having a bit of a chat with all of the arts organisations and looking at what what resources they had and what we could do together as a as a citywide offer. I then, um, along with Joe, presented a couple of different options for what we could make. In May, uh, we sent the proposal to the uh, Bristol and Bath Dish Law and D, who allocated us 15k. And then it's worth saying that we approached another a, a number of other funders, but they couldn't move. Um, kind of their timelines for responses were incompatible with the urgency of need that we had, and that kind of rapid response, which is really interesting, I think. Um, but we were awarded the 15,000 pounds and we decided to go ahead anyway on the 15,000 um, pounds. And there's a bit more timeline and we launched on the 1st of June um, with a kind of trial event on the 23rd. So the public facing side of this, you know, it's it's not rocket science. We made a microsite. It's a, it was the front facing public work. And to do that very quickly, we looked across all of the partner organisations and figured out where there was expertise that we could pull from. So we knew that there were graphic designers based within Bristol Old Vic, Watershed had a web development team, Colston Hall had marketing and press people who were not, these were all people that were not furloughed, quite a lot of staff within the arts organisations were furloughed. <coughs> At the same time, I did a bit of an audit on what content, and I should just say, I really hate the word content to describe kind of the rich and varied cultural offering of Bristol's creative scene, but it does the job for now, so I hope you don't mind me using it. But I really kind of looked at what content everybody had, you know, asking questions like, do you have archive material? Do you have audio recordings of your shows? Do you have um, 
photographs, videos, interesting experiments? And then what ideas do people have for stuff that they want to make? Are those ideas viable given the global pandemic and the fact that, you know, sometimes 80, 100% of your staff are furloughed, for example? Do you have the technical skills? We um, worked with Anna Starkey, who did an amazing job of matchmaking projects to volunteers. Um, we had something like 30 volunteers who were often people who were furloughed and wanted to help out. So. Um, some really exciting experiments came through that matchmaking of I've got this thing that I've always wanted to try and a volunteer that was able to just spend a bit of time helping make that happen. And then across both of those things, this kind of existing and new ideas, we thought a lot about how we can make this accessible. Does it need subtitling, audio description? Do we need uh, a BSL interpreter? And then we curated a programme from all of those ideas and existing pieces of content across the pilot period that meant that we had a rich and varied offering to audiences. And at the same time, we weren't competing for audiences online. There was a rhythm and a structure to what we presented. So we tried really hard to make sure that we weren't having a Bristol Old Vic event on the same time as St Paul's Carnival at the same time as a, a watershed event all on the same evening. There was a bit of a rhythm. That was something that we were noticing in other cities that lots of the arts organizations who weren't talking to one another, it felt like there was a lot of noise and a lot of web content being put out there and a lot of people just throwing stuff and hoping for the best and actually just taking a bit of a breath and really thinking about the rhythm of what the audience might enjoy. And um, yeah, that was really important. And then finally, we thought a lot about what voices were missing. You know, we looked at the programme as a whole and, and the week by week offering, and then we we tried to micro commission where we could with the little money that we had and um, going a long way to support and amplify voices that were underrepresented. So we had the core partnership of 13 organisations, but in actual fact, over the pilot period, the month long pilot, pilot period, that's a tongue twister. We worked with over 60 organisations, independent artists and festivals. Um, and we offered something like 140 online events or pieces of content from the best of Bristol's cultural scene. Um, I really love this phrase, so I'm going to read it out. But uh, we, we did from experimental digital initiatives through to day long music festivals, reimagined archive content to live cinema watch parties, living room raves to more intimate conversations. And it really, truly was that. Um, as Claire said, we were really interested in exploring what a digital offer looked like in a localized region. Like, what does a what does a local Internet look like? Uh, and I think we did that really well with being very targeted about where we were marketing the event to and sort of where we were putting online ads. Um, we had sort of 43.5% of audiences were based in the Southwest, 72% were based in the UK. Um, and people always ask for the the reach figures and I kind of don't think that's interesting so the only figure that I put they were really great but I just don't think that's the interesting metric um what I have shared in here is what the interactions were so that's people that have commented or turned up to an event or shared an event and that was about half a million interactions across the program this is a, a slide about how we spent the money uh, so you can see that we had a bit of in-kind support from the space, which paid for my time and Joe Bell's time and um, a bit of press support. That was the kind of the scoping phase. And they also supported us throughout the pilot with amplifying content and also offering training sessions where and when it was needed. Um, and the 15 grand cash grant from Bristol Bath R&D kind of was spent on commissioning work from communities underrepresented on the channel distribution boost for smaller organizations. This was kind of important. We were really worried that the big organizations would swallow up the offerings of smaller arts organizations or independent artists. So these little 50, 50 quid boosts that we could put on a Facebook um, post were really instrumental in leveling that playing field as well as making sure that if we had a small independent artist we were setting up a cross-posting relationship so that means there would be a bigger host organization with a larger platform that would help amplify that particular event so that kind of kind of micro boosts were really really important 
We also put in specific delivery uh, resource for kind of technically challenging projects. And some of that was really physical. So one of the interesting things that we ended up spending a bit of money on was putting in a health and safety um, expert to think through the challenges around reopening Trinity Centre for the St Paul's Carnival live stream, which Latoya can talk a little bit more about and thinking through like how that works with the council we weren't opening the, the the space to the public but even just to have people in the building was a was a concern and so that was a thing that we helped with um, and then it paid for myself um a communications lead john aitken who did these really he was completely brilliant for lots of many many different ways um, but he also made these really great trailers uh, that were that were made every week to kind of give a rhythm to the uh, to the programming and and that kind of I don't think anyone could at that period of time certainly I couldn't really see much further than a week ahead and so kind of doing these videos that talked about the next week was really important the reason that I talked about all of that was that that 15 grand really leveraged a lot of in-kind support that I think is interesting to know so um, we kind of did a bit of a tally and we can conservatively say that uh, the 15 grand leveraged about 62,000 pounds worth of in-kind and volunteer support. So that's people time, 120 days of in-kind volunteers, design time, web designers, the organizations allocating staff time. And uh, I also did a bit of an audit on how much the content that we, the 140 pieces of content that we shared, how much that costed. Um, and that came to a, an estimate value of about £40,000 across the pilot. So if, we were, if someone was coming to this and wanting to do this from scratch and they didn't have any resources at all, that kind of gives you a bit of an indication of what you'd need. Um, I've already talked about how the channel, channel worked, but if you want to be a bit nerdy about it, there's some really good uh, writing about this. Um, uh, yeah, one of the things that we were really interested in was kind of bringing familiar events from the city into online spaces and how that felt really comforting to local audiences and artists. That's something we heard over and over again. Um, I've talked about the channel trailer. I've talked about the... Um, uh, we also did an open call for any artists from across the city to um, submit a project uh, to Bristol Arts Channel and wherever possible we said yes to them and we helped make that happen. That sometimes was as simple as just putting it as a listing on our, our page but also um, kind of might be a bit of uh, expertise from one of our volunteers or myself or someone else within one of the partner organisations. We had about this was the thing that I feel a bit sad about, you know, we had about 70 inquiries um, from a really light touch open call. And um, I, I really wish we'd have had some micro grants, like a bigger pot that we could have given micro grants and commissioning opportunities for that work. Um, but maybe that's something that we can think about in the future. There are some case studies and I know that we have Jack, so I'm not going to talk about Bristol Vic at home. He can do that in a minute. And Claire's here and can talk about Watershed's case study. And obviously Latoya can talk about St Paul's case study in a moment. Um, uh, uh, Bristol Beacon, there's, there's a really lovely case study about Bristol Beacon who did a, a thing called Bristol Takeover Online. Uh, so the artist formerly known as Colston Hall, and they did two um, like 10 plus hours of live streamed music on YouTube that they did as a fundraiser, uh, which went extraordinarily well. So there's a little bit of information about that. And then fin the final case study is one on Bristol Museums, who I included because, you know, they did some really beautiful experiments actually. Um, and they they thought very carefully about how they could utilize things that they already had within their archive and, and use it in new ways and frame it in new ways um, during the pandemic. And I think that's really impacted how they think about technology. So there's some really interesting learnings from all of this. The first is that we asked all the partner organizations to rate their engagement in technology kind of pre, and, and I guess that's talking and speaking to their skills development over the period of engaging with the pilot phase. And um, pre lockdown and pre taking part in the pilot, they rated this on average as a 6.9 and post taking part in this pilot, it went up to an 8.4. 
really interestingly, um, we also asked about this idea of hybridity, which was something that Claire and I has talk, have talked an awful lot about actually over the last couple of weeks and months. But this um, emerging trend of um, physical and digital events and how much that might form part of the business models moving forward, even when you know the vaccine has been issued to everyone and we're back to business as normal. And what's really interesting is that that moved from a you know, how much did hybrid models of physical and digital form part of your business pre-lockdown was a 1.4 and post taking part in the pilot is a 7.2. So this is clearly something that is really interesting and that we should be thinking about how we can support. And then finally, we had um, some really great audience research done uh, from an associate of the University of Bath, Anna. Um, and there's lots of really interesting and rich learning from this, but the two things that really spoke to me to reflect on, I think, moving forward are, you know, I wrote my MA thesis in live streaming about 15 years ago now, and the th question that always comes up is people being very worried that if they put something online, it will stop audiences coming to their physical venue, and overwhelmingly audiences said, and this the conversation is still happening, and it's been happening for years, so I just want to put a stop to it, in that, you know, it was really clear that digital offer offerings promoted in-person attendance rather than kind of trying to replace it. It is, you know, instead of diminishing interest in physical attendance, online experiences inspired a desire to revisit performances and venues in person. And then the second thing is overwhelmingly active users of the Bristol Arts Channel website and, and people engaging with the content that we were offering from our partner organisations reported experiencing a greater sense of place and connection. They talked a lot about the mental health benefits, this kind of lifting mood and kind of that generosity, that community spirit felt very Bristol and it made me feel very proud that together we were able to offer something like this pilot during the early days of the pandemic and really show what we could do with a bit of seed funding and a bit of hustle and lots and lots of brilliant people just getting on and playing and experimenting together. So that's me finished. Uh, and I'm now going to hand over, I think, to Latoya. I'm looking at Claire, she's nodding, um, who is going to talk a little bit about um, what she did and how uh, St Paul's Carnival engaged with uh, Bristol Arts Channel. Thanks, Catherine. Um, that was great to see um, the, the kind of wash up summary from Bristol Arts Channel. We've done a um, similar process for uh, St Paul's Carnival, um, looking at kind of the, the numbers and the engagement and sort of reflecting on, on our learning from this year. It, it has been, it's been an extraordinary year. Um, if somebody said to me this time last year that I would put Carnival online, I would have, yeah, I, I would have seriously wondered what they were talking about is it and I think we were the first um, carnival to go digital this year um, so it's it's been quite quite a learning curve and engaging with the Bristol um, Arts Channel was also great because I'd be able to get hold of Catherine and and just have a bit of a freak out about how on earth you know what what's the tech how do I do this um, what different platforms do I need to think about so um, it's, it, it definitely has been a, a great partnership and a great learning experience. So um, thank you all for coming today. And what I'm going to do is uh, spend five minutes or so talking to you um, about what we did and how we did it. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the partnerships um, element of, of how we experienced uh, the digital event, um, what we learned and a little bit about the future as well. So on the, on the face of it, what the digital carnival was, um, was a two week online cultural programme, which culminated on carnival day uh, for an 11 hour live stream. And I think I'll probably just say here, uh, my intention was to follow carnival day. So to start at 12 and to end at 10 or somewhere thereabouts. Um, there was absolutely no need to do an 11 hour live stream. Um, it was excessive, really, really fun.
but excessive. Um, and I think uh, when I'm thinking about it in the future, I'll maybe cut down on that 11 hours, but boy, what an 11 hours it was. Um, and I guess I'll start with the why. We, we announced that St Paul's Carnival wouldn't, take, uh, wouldn't happen in 2020 on the day after lockdown was announced. Um, even at that time, we we were pretty we I was pretty clear that we would want to offer something during that that um, that carnival day, but had no idea what it was. And as you all know and would have experienced at that time, we were all kind of in very much uh, survival mode. So it took it took a good few weeks or so to to kind of or a couple of months to really think to to really come up with the what what that would look like and I think I was really inspired like most of you was watching a lot of Facebook parties um, and really inspired by what you could do what could be delivered so that that was kind of the beginning of of the idea to deliver carnival in a, in that kind of Facebook live type environment um, we had a really really small team carnival because carnival wasn't happening um, the, the team that we would normally ramp up to deliver wasn't there. So we relied heavily on volunteers. Some of those volunteers came from the Bristol Arts Channel, but I relied heavily on volunteers um, from across the city and a really small, um, amazing team to help deliver what we did. Um, I think one of, one of the interesting things was creating the content. And I spoke, I remember speaking to Catherine about this. I was really concerned about, um, the the quality of what it would look like and the the symmetry of all the comment the the content we put out um and and Catherine kind of talked me through thinking about um it was a very much carnival at home and shooting things on your on your mobile phone and having that rough and ready feel was was okay um and actually I think that really helped us to to brand the spirit up uh, united at home it was very much a rough and ready offering that um, people were sending their content in um, from all over the place on their phone and we weren't overly precious about what that looks like as long as the sound was good and the picture was good um, so th that was that was a really interesting experience bringing all that content together in a really um, in a really kind of basic way uh, I'm just looking at my notes here I think uh, the other thing that I at the at the beginning stage, branding the event was really important. So we knew that it wasn't going to be like um, 100,000 people on the streets of, of St. Paul's and we weren't trying to create that exactly. Um, so I worked with uh, our guy who did our, our website um, a couple of years ago um, and yeah, he helped us come up with, with the brand, um, United at Home, uh, what it would feel like, um, that we wanted to bring people together in their homes separately, but also that we were together. So that was really important. Um, and I think we also used lots of different platforms. So we used Twitch, we used Facebook, and we used, um, uh, what was the other one? Tw Twitch, Facebook, and Zoom. Um, so we could have some, uh, I, I, I went to a carnival Zoom party and that, that kind of, uh, everyone being together in a Zoom room, that visual ele element really worked well for, for, for Carnival, it was such a vis visual event. Um, so yeah, the, the branding was really important. The use of the different platforms and bringing that content together over the two weeks was just, just really was the bones of getting this event up and running. A um, little bit about partnerships. We, we obviously worked with the Bristol Arts Channel, but we, 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 um, Worked with Lakota as well on the day. We'd on on Carnival Day itself. We'd hop over to Lakota to to show some of the the Carnival inspired content they had, um, and then the brilliant Trinity offered us their space to do the live stream from, um, and that that came quite late in the day and came with its own challenges, um, as Catherine um, said. Uh, put it what it ended up doing rather than just being an online streaming thing we had an event within an event and that had the the, the um, trappings of, of an event management process which I hadn't accounted for and that that was a challenge um, and Alex coming on to do our health and safety was was just really helped us get that done so thanks Catherine for that um, 
so yeah, the, the, the partnerships were, were really important. We also teamed up with Bristol Beacon to do a special um, uh, stream from a place that I used to go to all the time when I lived in Hackney, the Vortex. Um, and uh, we, we cross-posted cross and streamed um, a uh, with, um, collective um, orchestra, which was just spectacular and amazing. Um, so those partnerships really drove how we worked together and, and made the experience a really rich one and a really varied one. Um, what we learned. So uh, I, I guess for the beginning, the why of what we did and why we did it. Um, Catherine mentioned the mental health benefits. One of the things that we really wanted to do was um, offer something positive back to the city. Carnival is such a um, important cultural event um, in the Bristol calendar. And we really wanted to be able to uh, offer something positive and bring people together and that, that and, and buoy people's spirits after what had been a really challenging few months. And the other thing is that we also realized that artists had been, you know, their work had been decimated by um, the, the pandemic. And we wanted, to, we wanted to give people a platform to show their work. Um, and to to pay people for for their for their arts. So those are two driving driving um, reasons behind it. And I think uh, what I've certainly learned is that those those two things run through everything that we do: our commitment to artists and our commitment to putting something positive into our cities um, and into our communities. Um, different ways of reaching people, um, reaching our re reaching audiences. We had. Um, a reach of 250,000 um, during the two week uh, 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 Spirit Up event. And in the, on the day, we had people in the Zoom room from Ukraine, from Cyprus, from the United States, um, people that wouldn't necessarily have been on the streets of, of St Paul's for Carnival. So that's really helped us think, of, think about our reach and how we reach a wider audience. Um, I mentioned the branding, that, that was absolutely critical to um, getting our voice out there and um, and really packaging something that that was different that we could that, that yeah that people could engage with and, and latch on to um, I think also people behave very differently on, on um, when they're uh, engaging online. Um, for your event. So one of, one of the things that I, I think is a real takeaway for, for me is that the cultural programming, the two-week cultural programming that we put in, um, I've had lots of feedback from people for things that they, they learned or took away about Carnival, the origins of Carnival, why Carnival, why you're on our streets, um, uh, coming to our streets to celebrate. That, that was an amazing opportunity to really engage people with the educational piece um, and the tech, of course, you need to make sure that you have the right tech. I'm going to we'll talk about some of the future stuff in the in the panel discussion. Oh, I'm going to also introduce you uh, introduce you to Jack um, from Bristol Vic. He'll come in and. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, amazing presentation from uh, Catherine and. Uh, really interesting uh, stuff from Latoya about uh, Carnival. Um, I suppose we, I mean, we were quite involved at the beginning uh, and throughout. And um, I suppose for us, the interesting thing about the story is like looking at where we were and then via Bristol Arts Channel, where we are and where we're going. Um, and it is really worth recapping that where we were as a theatre was a reopened theatre reconnected to Bristol but very much still um, a theatre in the same manner as theatre has been done since the ancient Greeks in person in a place and our digital uh, side of things really only existed uh, to facilitate people buying tickets and coming to the physical place. Um, when we had to close we had this big moment of going, okay, well, how do we maintain the thing that is the theatre, which is people coming to a place to connect while they share an experience? How do we do that when you're not allowed to come to a place to connect and share an experience? Um, 
And this is where the kind of ideas from our point of view came in of going, well, if we can get a play or a group of plays or something, whether live or from our archive and, and work out how to bring that to people, we will do that. Um, and then Tom and Claire talked and the rest of the story, Catherine has neatly summed up. Um, what we really found was that Bristol Arts Channel solved quite a lot of the problems of how do you maintain a really clear connection with an audience? So it's rather than just, we're gonna put a video out there on the internet, which is good, the localizing effect of Bristol Arts Channel and the, in a sense, targeting effect of the cultural viewers in Bristol, the people who engaged in the scene who really, um, who would definitely miss it now that it's all shut. That connection directly to that audience was deeply important for us to feel like we weren't just putting a video on YouTube and just hoping people watched it and are actually doing what we were meant to be doing, which was bringing art to Bristol for people to engage in and share in and connect through. Um, and yeah, so we, we our part of it was Bristol Old Vic at home uh, and that was split into three pieces. We had shows, we had, um, stuff for families and people uh, at home with their kids in lockdown, um, a sort of family hub of resources and entertainment. Uh, and we also had an open stage online, which was where people could submit creative things they've done at home and be exhibited through our channels to our audience. And we had a lot of engagement on all of that. Uh, and lots of it was helped by the amplification brought by Bristol Arts Channel. Um, off the back of that, uh, when we got to the kind of end of these events, uh, our five big plays um, and our few live events, things like Love Letters, um, Straight From The Heart by Uninvited Guests, which was live on Zoom and part of this sort of global tour of uh, Zoom shows. Um, once we got to the end of that sort of programme, we went, well, how do we maintain this? Because the world is different now. Um, and even though we're desperate for people to come back into our building, we're desperate for things to reopen so that we can get back that in-person connection. How do we maintain that connection that we've built digitally? And I mean, and let's be honest, the arts can't just exist on um, subsidy. How do, we, how do we pay for it? How do we make some money? How do we keep these cultural businesses going into the future? I.e., how do we put this stuff behind a paywall in a way that maintains the connection, that continues um, the, the size of audience we managed to garner um, without putting people off. Uh, and that's where we are at the moment. So the kind of, from our point of view, the, the follow-up, if you like, to our first season that went out with Bristol Arts Channel, we just launched. Um, and that is five more plays uh, available online on demand but this time for a small fee uh, and that experiment is still running. So uh, we'll, we'll see whether that become, you know, whether that becomes successful enough uh, to maintain. But yeah, the, the really important thing for us in doing this partnership was being able to keep local and keep connected to our audience. And I mean, Bristol has good form for this, um, certainly from an industry point of view, uh, we've got networks like BAM, uh, which we work within to help do co-promotion at normal times. And so I think that there was a really good will and infrastructure to build on to create a kind of citywide uh, cultural moment. And yeah, I mean, we love being involved in it and we're really proud of it. Um, and I'll, I'll stop watering on now. So I'll hand back to Claire. Um, but yeah, that's us. Great, thank you all um, for for kind of taking us through those journeys. Um, and I guess I'll add a little bit about Watershed, which um, which chimes with all of the things that have been said. 
um, I guess ex the, the opportunity to be experimental online was one of the big things for Watershed. And that might be uh, seem a bit odd for people who know us well, because we've been um, experimenting with digital for, for many years. Um, Pre-YouTube, we had a lot of projects which put video onto the internet. But a lot of the work we do is supporting artists to, um, to create work. And a lot of that work uses digital technologies excuse me, uses digital technologies, um, but in the physical real world. So it's it's often using the, a tool of digital to create a physical experience. So, um, and, and our internet content is, has recently been more around connecting to audiences in a conversation about the work that we do. So Bristol Arts Channel allowed us to experiment with um, different formats. Um, we had an online cooking demo, which I hosted, which was really fun, but really thinking about about how can we use digital to engage people in all parts of our business and of course the cafe bar is one of the key places of togetherness for watershed um, we put deaf conversations about cinema online um, and and of course people came from all over the country because there are not many um, chances to talk about cinema and film um, in BSL um, and that asks us some really interesting questions about why we would go back to um, only holding that within a physical venue um, can we even go back is it right to go back so those are those are questions that that are really coming up for us in what we did we handed over our online spaces to artists to collectives like Cargo, um, who did a um, who did a project, uh, sorry, who hosted a panel discussion about Black Lives Matter and about what was happening in the city and about Cargo as a response to some of the inequity and in how we hear about um, the stories of Bristol, and to Tom Marshman, who did the most amazing kind of Annette Curtains um, parties, and for us handing over control to other people, not even being there to chair or curate them, was a really great experiment in the richness of, um, of our community and sort of, and learning to let go a bit. And I guess one of the other things that really strike, that, that stays with me is um, Kate from Make. When she was talking about what had been useful about Bristol Arts Channel, she talked about that notion of togetherness. Um, but from a curator's point of view, we were meeting together on a weekly basis to talk about our programs, to share ideas, to connect. And, to, and that's one of the things that's really stayed outside of the sort of programming boundaries of Bristol Arts Channel is that we all know each other a little bit more. We will understand how our own programs work, how people put their ideas together, what kind of timescales they work on, which I think will allow loads more opportunity in the future for us to work together together. Um, but I am going to pick up some of the questions from the audience and um, do audience do stick stuff in the Q&A. Um, but I'm going to start um, by asking the panel um, just to think a little bit about access and inclusion, because that was a really important part of what we did. As has been said, we looked at how we could make sure things were captioned, how we could bring in as much BSL um, as, as we could. But obviously, there's a huge opportunity that digital brings. To, to give people access who couldn't physically be in a building, which might be because of their um, of a disability, or it might be because of where they live, or it might be because of caring responsibilities. There's loads of reasons why people can't come to physical spaces, but also the digital divide. We know from lockdown that there isn't an equity in who has access to fast internet or WYSI devices. So I'd just like you to kind of think about how you guys are feeling that at the moment and what you're thinking about it. Who wants to start? Jack, you've, you've unmuted first. Oh no, Latoya, go. <laughs> you had your mouth um, poised. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. Um, the, the digital inclusion slash exclusion thing is, is is a really um and and access is is something that we're thinking about um, and talking to, to, to talking about in lots of different spaces um for us one of the things i was really aware of was that our community elders that are such a important and integral part of carnival normally um uh, our digital carnival um i not many of them would have engaged with it as much as i would want them to so 
that that means that my planning for next year is all about how we can work with partners to make sure our older communities um, are better, uh, are, are digitally included and can take part, um, not just in Carnival, but also to stay connected because the, the, a big thing for, uh, throughout this pandemic is how do we stay connected? And, and for most of us, it has been through this, this kind of digital world, um, but it's, it's, really, it's now really important for us to think about um, parts of our audiences that, that may be excluded from that. Um, and I, th I think that the other learning, which I mentioned earlier, is, is about how we can reach beyond the local community, beyond local. Um, I think there's a great opportunity there to, to um, outreach nationally and also glo globally. So we're, we're talking to partners about how our next digital event might um, be streamed in the Caribbean um, and, and for us to make new connections. Um, so yeah, that, that w it, it's it's an integral part of our conversation. Thinking about what we do next. Great, Jack. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that came out of a essentially entirely digital experience, uh, and now we're back in a world of thinking about uh, physical experiences as well, um, is a sort of hybrid approach because there's positive things uh, in terms of accessibility um, through digital and negative or difficult things uh, and the same in the physical spaces i mean we suffer from in our industry a perception that theater ain't for most people it's just for posh people basically and actually one way of being able to kind of show that it is more accessible is by saying look here's here is what we do this is the theater stuff that we have and Certainly in this first season with Bristol Arts Channel, it was put out there free to air. And so what we found from that is a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily actually have been in our auditorium watching those shows suddenly were watching them and were engaging with us in a way that in a way that didn't happen before. And a lot of that is because we as an industry didn't. Uh, we really talked the talk of trying to make things more accessible without really going there. And I think that the digital crunch point in March, April forced us all to confront that. And because we, as a sector, I think, went out there to try and make things uh, free, it's almost like stepping up to the plate as a kind of cultural sector going in this time of difficulty, the le the, at least we can provide some entertainment by taking a slightly different kind of philosophy behind why we were doing things, we suddenly made things a lot more kind of certainly economically um, accessible. I mean, yes, there, there's perpetual challenges with ensuring that all video co content is captioned or, um, or signed if, if needed um, and how to do that, especially with super low budget things. Um, but in a way, I think that how we translate the on mass connection that digital brings back into our physical spaces. That's the real, for me, that's the real access question. And, and can I ask um, all, all of you and pre perhaps Catherine, um, Sally um, in the questions has talked about participation and how, how audiences participated in the various forms of content that we saw across the channel. Um, and I think it, that's interesting, isn't it? Because it wasn't just broadcast, was it? It wasn't just about kind of um, sit back, here's something we've got in the can um, that we filmed in 1980 and we've digitized it and we're throwing it out on our YouTube channel. Um, participation is sort of key to feeling that belonging and togetherness. Mm. Yeah, just, just um, partly reflecting on the last question and, and this as well, I, there's, there's a couple of things around access and, and inclusion and engagement that are really interesting. They're all the buzzwords in one fell swoop I just made there, but you know, 70% um, of uh, people watching videos on Facebook have it muted. So actually, you know, subtitling isn't just a, a thing about access, it's just, it's just a very practical, useful thing to do. And it, that was one of the really interesting things from this process and other jobs that I've done, like really understanding that people think that that doing access well is quite an expensive thing and sometimes it can be, but actually, you know, subtitling a video isn't a, um, 
a, a money thing it's a time thing do you know what I mean so there's that kind of base level and then secondly I think there's been this really interesting thing around audiences upskilling you know not just the art uh, we're thinking a lot about the arts organizations uh, upskilling but you know my dad is on zoom now he has regular zoom meetings with his friends that was not a sentence I thought I would say last year and I'm sorry if you're here dad I don't know um <laughs> <laughs> but you know there's that kind of you know a general upskilling and I think one of the things that we tried really hard to do was kind of match match that and make sure that we were offering across the program lots of different types of you know uh, experiences so you know we had like you missed the title Nacho Problem which is the best title going Claire for you know the cook along Thanks for reminding everyone Thank you. I can't let that one die. It was too good. But, you know, so that was, you know, people would buy the ingredients and do a physical cook along in their in their homes. Um, and then, you know, you had Bristol Old Vic after their, their streams, which were very much a, you watch a YouTube and you can comment alongside it. But it was quite a traditional broadcasty type environment. Afterwards, you know, you were able to go and do a post show talk, which was a very friendly kind of chatty, um, felt like being at the bar kind of vibe to it. Um, and one of my favorite things was St George's um, Bristol, which not, uh, I think only about 40 people each weekend, but there was, they have a philosopher in residence. And on Sundays, the philosopher would do a newspaper reading. So everyone would gather with a cup of coffee on a Sunday morning and read the newspaper together and talk about it from a philosophy perspective. And I thought that that was one of the really beautiful, like intimate, kind of experiences that you could have on the channel and I think what we what I was trying to do as a curator is think about it think about all the different ways that you can meet your audience where they are um and and what would be the most beautiful way to to have that exchange with an audience member and I think that is um that sense of togetherness I can I can really remember things that I did online and almost forget that they happened in little boxes yeah. I can almost just remember that sense of togetherness that we that that we feel when we're sat in a darkened theatre or in a sweaty club or about to promenade the streets um that being together as humans is so necessary for all of our health and well-being and I think we really did experiment with ways that we could do that where did you find the limits of the internet? Where, where, where are you finding that, um, that you're still haven't quite designed experiences or where the, where the physical just isn't replaceable? I mean, we find, or I've certainly found that there was a psychological break uh, in terms of that sweaty club feel. Um, when, kind of lockdown one came to an end, um, even though there were still lots of restrictions in lots of parts of the country um, and life really didn't go back to normal, people still working at home. That sense that actually everyone was in one, ma one massive kind of national social lock-in together, meaning that there was a kind of additional significance when people did attend cultural events uh, online, there was a togetherness about that. Actually, once that sort of sense of solidarity nationally um, in terms of doing one thing which is sitting in your house um, was was over actually achieving that sense of being all in one room together experiencing something I think became a lot more challenging um, and I think it, it, you know it's returning people back to a, a sense where the digital stuff is is just transactional it's between you and a product rather than you and an experience um, and I so I think the real challenge is how do we maintain that sense of shared experience rather than just going back to actually all the cultural organizations have built Netflix clones each. Um, and that's a really interesting conundrum that, um, and I think we're going to try and address that by doing a hybrid. So live stuff where you've got people in person and people at home sharing an experience that only happens live. It's not, it's not being recorded and will go out on demand. It's only in that moment. And I hope that that will essentially regenerate that sense that we all had um, over lockdown one. 
I, I agree, Jack, and I think it's definitely something that Watershed are looking at, but I think it's important that we don't think we've solved those problems, the, the problems of user experience, I guess, um, because the wrappers that exist around things, it's quite easy to point something at an audience digitally or to host an audience physically, but to find something that feels like an analogy is that it? Where, like um or at least coherent for each type of audience so that there isn't a kind of mass FOMO that the other thing should would always be the better one it's going to be an interesting time and I guess I keep telling people like to bear with us as a sector because I think there's more work to do there's more experiments that we need to do to to really get that stuff right yeah I suppose the simplest example of that is if you did a hybrid panto and uh you said he's behind you are you addressing it at the camera or at the audience in the room and i think that that sort of almost sums up that problem of how do we make it truly shared and you're absolutely right they sort of front ends the kind of user interfaces how do we develop those to facilitate that the, the return path almost if you shout he's behind you in an empty forest does it does it even count? Victoria? Um, I think that, yeah, there are definitely limits um, to the digital experience. Um, I, I think the way that I, the way that I have seen it and, and kind of try to um, place it within the St Paul's Carnival is that we're not trying to recreate Carnival with our digital events. Um, I think that the, they are obviously linked and some things can be done um, digitally, but I, the, the way that we, we marketed it and the way that I think about it is that it's a different offering. Um, and what's been, I guess what's been really interesting is that for Black History Month, we, we kind of took the, the framework of Spirit Up and delivered um, a, a program of events that was similar similar to uh, Spirit Up being mostly online, but we had some options to do some live stuff. So we did some live stuff at Bristol Old Vic. Um, we filmed in um, Lakota again, we partnered with them. Um, and y y I think that for us, it's we, we've never offered um, anything digitally like that before that sort of creating content that that volume and, and um, that way of engaging audiences it's it's not been something that we've, we've ever done before um, so I hope that um, we have created sort of a, a, a sl an, as well as bringing some of our, our regular audience people who are live and with us on the streets I hope that we've created an, a new slightly newer audience a different audience for our online content um, but yeah, similarly to Jack, I think the, the future for us is, is looking at that hybrid model, how we bring those offerings together to complement each other, um, but also to expand the, to expand the experience because I started off saying that um, there are limitations with the digital offer, but I, I, in my presentation, I talked about um, the two week cultural program that we had before the, the live stream on Carnival Day. And that really enabled us to tell a story about Carnival that I think people miss on, on the day when they come to, to the actual event. And that for me is one of the biggest takeaways from, from that experience is that we can actually engage and educate in a way that I think Carnival is a much more kind of visceral, I'm going here, I'm going there kind of experience. You, you, you can capture people's imagination in a different way. And I really want to play with that. Catherine. Um, so we're kind of talking a lot about hybrid hybridity at the moment, but just to just to wrap up the, the thinking about what are the um, limitations? I mean, yeah, it's kind of messiness, isn't it? It's that kind of happenstance and being lost in a crowd that you get, at, um, you know, if when I've been to St Paul's Carnival, like getting a bit lost and, and bumping into people and and kind of stumbling across things is, is is something that's sometimes a bit difficult to to recreate online. But that was one of the reasons that I talked about the Lost Horizon example, because actually I think they did that really, really well, that virtual environment and kind of bumping into people and going, oh, well, hang on, you're, you're you. And I mean, uh, last night, the 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 pixel shed that uh, the pixel version of watershed that was made uh, to host an event was another really beautiful example of like people being able to 
to stumble around a, a space but I think there's more interesting not that those aren't there's other really interesting uh, examples of of that I think could be fruitful for us to explore and then on hybridity I mean yeah I mean <laughs> it's really interesting that we're giving it a name now because I feel like we've been doing this for decades but um in in lots of different ways um 15 years ago when I wrote the MA thesis I was looking at NT Live that's how long NT Live has been going now um and kind of the Met Opera and um, that kind of works really well, right? Because you're filming a show that happens on a proscenium March stage and you're putting it into a cinema where audiences gather together and they're watching a thing on a cinema screen. So the audience behavior is kind of mirrored, right? But then the problem that we've, that has been very prevalent and, and kind of noticeable in the last kind of couple of months is when when that kind of audience experience is put onto an online space or onto a YouTube channel you're not also replicating the audience experience and so it feels a little bit jolty um, similarly when I worked at National Theatre Wales we made a lot of shows on the side of a mountain or like uh, on a beach or very rarely in a theatre space we were we were usually somewhere completely random around the country and you know when you're in a forest and you're making a show and it's a promenade piece around a forest like how you would film that and how you would share that online has to feel very different to kind for online audiences so you begin to think about what is the audience experience that people are having physically and then and then what's the route in for thinking about that in an online environment and and there are loads of really brilliant rich examples of of how this has already been done that i don't want us to forget because we're in this new post pandemic world i think there's there's that learning that needs to be built upon and we kind of have a big piece of work to do as a sector to get everybody up to speed with the stuff that's already happened um but certainly that kind of there's a really interesting book by a guy called philip orslander called liveness that's really old but kind of great um so like some of the examples are really dated but i kind of love it um and it talks about different kinds of liveness in a virtual environment and i think that thinking of exploring that as a reference point and using that as a bit of a mode to talk we don't really have the language yet thoroughly enough to talk about these different kinds of online experience i'm slightly rambling so yeah I'll stop there. um one of the things i've been thinking a lot about is um the early research that watershed did with hp labs right um, yeah. i guess was like 12 years ago and, and out of that and some of the work that the university of the west of england did was a thing called design dimensions where you um where you sought to frame the experience for the audience in words that they would understand so that um, they would understand what time of day it took place, what how long the experience would take. I, my pet hate is being in things and I don't know how long they're going to take and whether they'll uh, whether I have to do something to end it. I've sort of got this fear of being stuck forever in a VR experience and I don't know when it's ended. Um, and also to describe in accessible language what kind of part participation and interaction people will use and I've been really thinking a lot about that because um, when you look at Nigella's Instagram um, and she tells you to, to, um, to go on run for you Claire I can't yeah, I <laughs> but, but when, she, when she tells you that she's just published a, um, a recipe um, she tells that she tells you exactly how to click on the link and access her recipe and she just does this extremely sort of democratic accessible explanation of technology which I think um, we can all forget um, and that as we push this stuff forward we really really have to remember that it isn't sort of first nature and that we are experimenting with form and that we should keep explaining and grounding people within these experiences. Um, so we've got a lovely comment from um, Sophie um, Voinovich, apologies if I say your name wrong Sophie, um, who appears to be coming from Russia 
um, she's saying that um, it's wonderful to hear experiences from a different country because in Russia it's a sad situation during the pandemic with events and I guess I would say it's still a sad situation here as well we're talking about small sort of um, sort of moments of hope and optimism but it's been difficult for the city and for the sector and she asks about continuing the project in the future um, and how many companies would be interested in supporting a project like this. And I think um, you've all talked a little bit about that, but what's next for, for you? Um, what, what are the things that you're really hoping to achieve in the next year, thinking about this kind of hybridity? Latoya, go, I know that you've got exciting plans. <laughs> um, I think what's the, th the thing that I've come out of this experience, um, some of the things that have been at my, the forefront of my mind is about partnerships and strategic partnerships across the city, across the cultural sector, um, and how some of the larger organisations work with some of the smaller organisations um, to deliver together. Um, I think that the Bristol Arts Channel was a great um, experience and um, pilot for looking at what some of those issues might be um and one of the things i'm always really aware of is is that uh as a small arts organization it's it's great to be asked to come to the table um but if you don't have the capacity to take the opportunities at that table then i struggle to understand why you were there and i had that conversation um during the bristol arts channel kind of weekly meets um, and it was something that we we really tried to to address in, in how we we made that made that space more democratic. So I think uh, partnerships moving forward, partnerships is something that's really really important. And thinking about next year's carnival carnival event, whatever that was going to look like, because right right at this moment in time, if we were going for full fat carnival, we would need to be planning that now. We're not in an environment where we can do that. Um, so what's great is that we have this model that we've delivered this year that can be finessed and rolled out again. Um, I think that um, it was great to finish the Bristol Arts Channel with that 11 hour stream party. And I like the idea of having, as Catherine was saying, some, not something that was going to lock your content in or give it away to some, but something that was a platform for for your content, but brought us all together and enabled um, collaborations with Bristol Beacon, with Bristol Old Vic, um, and between artists. So I think that the model for, for Carnival next year is very much going to be thinking about how we continue those, those partnerships within our local community, but also in the centre of the city, um, and how we use that kind of streaming, that hybrid um, function that we now have to, to be more inclusive. Thank you. Jack? Um, well, I can't talk about some of the events that we have planned because they're still being negotiated. Oh, go on. Um, go on. There's it, no one it, here. No one's going to say a thing. I, I, I couldn't possibly. Um, I mean, unfortunately, because of the tier system, our sort of first proper um, experiment with hybrid um, couldn't happen so it just became digital only which was with wise children and knee high um flying lovers of the text you can uh from the 11th watch it on demand on on our website so so go there and, and buy it um quick plug um but that show was originally conceived to have a audience in, in the room and then it um go out live uh broadcast online at the same time now that couldn't happen because of the tier system and putting Bristol in tier three. Um, but that was really where the beginning of the kind of journey of how do we explore and understand the two different audiences, the two different experiences. In a way, the only way into um, unlocking that kind of tricky question of uh, sort of live feedback uh, that you get in a room, how do you do that digitally? Or um, how do you address people at home or in the room at the same time. In a way, we haven't been able to do those experiments yet because, um, uh, because of the COVID situation. But that's the first step is kind of taking, and it is all baby steps in the end of the day, 
is taking those steps of doing how do we do both and what do we improve about both to improve it for everyone. Um, another thing, I'm mean, just reflecting on something that uh, Catherine was saying, uh, there is an interesting conundrum about being kind of a venue uh, in the digital world because venues don't really exist in the digital world. It's the work that exists. So there's an interesting philosophical question that we need to look at technologically about what does a venue mean um, online and is it more than just the fact that things happen in the venue that you're then putting out online um, and I think that's part of this hybrid question as well is how do we redefine the venue um, for this because actually uh, you know we've Flying Lovers have gone out uh, through multiple venues and uh, through Nehi's website and through Wise Children's website and Bristol Vic. So in a sense, it was venue free. Um, and that brought with it its own huge audience. So yes, um, that's a very woolly answer to that question in that it isn't really an answer. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot to consider in the hybrid world. The different workflows and organizational structures and capacities that we all, that we're all having to design at the moment um, is is pretty exciting. Catherine, we I'm going to draw this event to a close by um, handing to you essentially to ask what next. What 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 are you working on next? I know you've got a long queue of people who who want your digital expertise, but what are you excited about thinking about and doing? Oh God, Claire, I can't. Um, you can't yeah, talk about really, I'm not allowed. No, no, I'm not allowed to talk about some of it. But yeah, there's some really interesting. There's some really interesting things happening. I think, like as we begin to open back up to the city. So I'm co-creative director of two light festivals. One that opens tomorrow in Gloucester, and one and Bristol Light Festival that we're we're doing in the new year. And they're both designed as tier three festivals because we thought that was the only safe way to go about doing it. And so thinking about how those events are accessible online is a is a natural part of the curatorial program, neither of which have been announced yet, though, Claire. So you'll have to pay attention. But there's some interesting kind of thinking that we're trying to do and trying to play with. Um, and, you know, yeah, I think I, I, there is a lot of other people that I'm talking to and trying to help through with processes. I think the commonality is, you know, I, I've only been taking gigs with people during this pandemic time who I know that any work that we do around technology development or thinking about hybridity is something that they're going to care about in a couple of years time when the pandemic is far behind us touch wood do you know what I mean like because what I do worry is that um, audiences might get a bit sick of digital and as soon as they can get back out they're going to kick against everything and that's going to undo some of the good work and learning yeah. um so that's been a, that's been a really important thing is is making sure that everything that we do now we don't lose it you know what i mean all of this great and rich experimentation time it's something that we that we take forward with us and you know in in very simple and small ways and in bigger programming decisions um, i'm hoping that you know certainly we'll see a lot more digital expertise there's loads of really great people like me who could be consulting with arts organizations that um even just a small amount of consultancy time would really transform that that organization's approach to technology and i think kind of anything like that those kind of um embedding that kind of digital literacy within the creative programming part of an organization rather than where it currently tends to sit which is in communications it's a bit boring thinking about organizational structure but really embedding it into the creative offer and creative proposal of organizations i think that's something that i'm really interested in trying to foster in in future talks yeah. Thank you. And um, I'm sorry for the couple of people whose questions we haven't had a chance. Um, and I just wanted to give a tiny plug to Catherine's um, weekly in, um, oh my TikTok God. curation on Instagram, which is a, um, a highlight of my week. And just also really, <laughs> I think, um, the th things about the different, the blurring of forms, the different places where people are, um, are, are curating, collecting and broadcasting themselves. So following Catherine Jukes on 
Instagram. Yeah, um, thank you. Jack, Latoya, Catherine, <laughs> thank you so much, um, both for the project um, and for the wonder that was Bristol Arts Channel and also um, and also for sharing and, and codifying and really thinking deeply about what that's meant for your organizations today. Um, I'm gonna hand back over to Bo. Thanks for joining us um, and see you soon. Hey, thank you, Claire. And thank you to the panel. I mean, this has been just such a fascinating look back at what has been achieved and a look forward to, to where things can go. So um, again, just a thank you to all on that. And just to remind our audience that this has been recorded. And so there's going to be plenty of people who will find what has been discussed and what has been shown here super interesting. Uh, so make sure to pass that forward that they can visit the Watershed's YouTube channel uh, shortly after this uh, and to be able to, 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 to listen back and to share that. And also, if you want to know more about what we do at Bristol and Bath Creative, find us at bristolbathcreative.org. Um, but yes, uh, just to wrap up there to everybody, look forward to seeing you in our future hybrid world. And most of all, um, stay safe. Thank you, everyone.